if you don't know me from before, my name is Smarcus. I have been working in this kind of intersection of uh, web and Java for the past 20 years or so. I'm a big outdoor enthusiasm. Somebody might call me a nerd even, and I wouldn't take offense to that. And I work as the VP of Darrell here at Vaden. A couple of uh, just kind of warnings up front. I'm not a AI expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm more of a curious learner who likes to tinker with things. And I just wanted to share kind of what I've been building over the past couple of months here, uh, kind of as a side project where I'm using ChatGPT uh, and our documentation to build a really kind of cool little uh, assistant for our documentation. So before we get to that, now that everything hopefully works a little bit better, a couple of housekeeping rules. So as you've already noticed, the lines are muted. You weren't able to shout at me like, hey, Marcus, your, <laughs> your audio isn't working. Uh, what you can do is ask questions during uh, the webinar using the questions panel that I see hundreds of you have already found. So good. Keep using that to ask questions. You can ask questions during uh, while I'm talking. If it's something that's very kind of relevant to what I'm doing, I might kind of answer that right then and there. If not, I'll answer those questions at the end. And we'll send you a link to the slides and recording uh, after the after the webinar ends within a day or so. Good. So. If you are new to Vaad and you haven't heard of Vaad before, I just wanted to give you a really quick overview of what we do as a company. So as a company, what we do is we help folks on Java build really great web apps. For that, we have a huge library of UI components, kind of all the different building blocks you need as you are building applications, ranging from like tiny little things like buttons and text fields all the way up to bigger components like data grids and editors and menus and things like that. We have two frameworks that you can use these components with. One is called Vaden Flow, which is the kind of classic uh, Vaden experience where you build your entire UI front end and everything in Java. And then we have Hilla, which is a newer framework that we launched last year, which uses a Spring Boot backend, a reactive uh, TypeScript front end, and those same components. All right. So with that, let's get to the actual thing after we do a couple of poll questions. So. Before we get started with building stuff, I want to hear a little bit about what you do. So uh, you should see in the bottom right corner a polls tab. And if you click on that, you should see that there are two polls in here. And the first question I wanted to ask you is, have you ever uh, built in any AI functionality into the software that you've built? So have you done anything similar to what we're doing here right now? And the other thing is, are you using actively any kind of AI tools when you're developing, whether that's like Copilot within your ID or maybe ChatGPT or a similar LLM outside of your ID? So I can see the answers are kind of flowing in here. So it seems like the majority of you are uh, at using some sort of AI tool while developing about 53%, whereas uh, 44% are saying that, no, you're not using any AI tools for development right now with a small minority of a few people saying that they are not developers. So that's not really applicable to them. Then if we're looking at building AI functionality into software, we can see that the vast majority, 60% are planning to do that, but have not done any of that yet. Uh, some don't really have any plans yet, but might get inspired by seeing some cool use cases, maybe this one or something else uh, in the future. And about 15% of you have already done something with this. So it's very good. Really interesting to kind of see how quickly this is all, all kind of already uh, works. It, it's kind of hard to imagine that was like barely half a year ago when ChatGPT launched and kind of brought a lot of these tools into the mainstream that had been kind of brewing for a longer period before then. All right, well, thank you for answering those. Let's get to it. So the problem I had, the problem that kind of caused me to want to build this thing in the first place is that if you go into ChatGPT or any other tool right now, and you ask it a question about say Hilla, like how do I secure my endpoint in a Hilla application? In this case, it was kind of smart enough to know that it didn't know. So it told me like, well, since I only know things until September 2021, I don't know of any framework called Hilla, but here are some general things you could look at. And that's not 
at all helpful when I'm trying to develop something. I want like a specific answer for the thing that I'm doing. So my thought was, well, couldn't I like make chat GPT read our documentation and then become smarter? And that way, if I ask a question, I might actually get a much more specific answer that actually helps kind of uh, me with the development thing that I'm doing right now. So that is exactly what I did. If you want to play around with this as we're kind of going along, you should be able to find a live version of this up on this URL. So vodin docs assistantflydev Leave this up here for, for a second so you can log in there and check it out if you want. And as a kind of uh, just heads up, this is a kind of a pre-release, just my hobby version of, of this thing. So it's not like a official tool or anything yet. We do have plans to make a more official version of something like this starting after the summer. So uh, hopefully we'll have something a little bit more robust kind of integrated into, into our docs in, in a kind of upcoming months. All right, so if we look at the challenge that we're facing here, then like, what are we trying to solve? There are a couple of things that we need to take into consideration. One being that any kind of LLM has usually a training cutoff date, like how far uh, into the future do they have, or not future, but when was the last date that they have kind of included in their training set for chat GPT that we're using here? Like we noticed earlier, that is in 2021. Uh, a lot of the LLMs are able to kind of do internet searches on their own to kind of try to patch this deficiency. But the challenge is that if they go and search the internet, we can't really affect what they find. And that might not be the right thing that we want to actually do. The other thing is that for Vaden, our documentation changes quite often. So we're constantly working on it, updating, and to kind of make things even more challenging, we have different product versions and different versions of each of those products. And it would be super helpful for the user to be able to kind of narrow down and say like, hey, I'm using Hilla with React or I'm using Flow, only kind of narrow down your answers to just this one thing that I'm using. That way you get the most relevant answers. And the final thing that's gonna be a challenge for us is that there is a limited amount of things that we can pass in to ChatGPT. In this case, we're using a 4K um, token uh, context size. And that means that we have roughly 3,000 words uh, available for us that needs to be both the prompt that we give it, all the documentation that we want to pass in, and leave enough space for the answer to be fit in there as well. So that means that we can really just pass in all the documentation because that would be way too much. So that gives us a challenge of like, how do we figure out out of all the documentation that we have in Avadi and what is the most relevant pieces of that documentation for answering this specific question? So that's the first thing that we want to figure out here. And the solution to that is using vector embeddings. If you're not familiar with vector embeddings from before, uh, let's start with a little example. So if you've ever used a color picker, you probably know that you can essentially take any color and you can turn that into a uh, three value vector of red, green, and blue values. And that vector essentially is able to kind of uh, describe any color that is out there. So ve vectors with very similar values would be very kind of closely on that color spectrum. And likewise, colors that have very different values would be very far kind of in that color spectrum. So vector embeddings are essentially that same idea, but applied on a much more kind of complex scale. So there is a way for us to take essentially any piece of text, run it through an algorithm, let's say, and we get out a vector. In this case, we're getting a 1500 plus uh, dimension vector that describes that text's meaning in a multidimensional space. Now that's, for all intents and purposes, that can be a magic black box to us because OpenAI uh, provides an API that we can just pass in a text and we get this vector back. So we don't need to do the math ourselves here. So what we need to do then is we need to somehow kind of figure out, uh, kind of take our documentation, split it into suitable pieces, run it through this 
uh, vector embedding API to get these vectors and then store them in a vector database. Now, vector database is essentially a database that's specialized in storing these embedding vectors. And here I'm drawing them out in two dimensions because I'm not very good at drawing in 1500 dimensions, but hopefully this gets the idea across. So as I'm kind of added more things into my hypothetical vector database here, you can see they're kind of plotted along uh, these axes, depending on how they're kind of related to each other. So what happens then if a user comes in and they want to ask a question? Well, what I can do is I can take that question, I can run it through the same uh, embedding uh, algorithm and get a vector that describes its meaning. And I can then take that vector and perform a search in the vector database. And what that means is I should be able to kind of capture the documents that are most closely related in terms of their meaning to this question. So this should give us a pretty good idea of what are the most relevant uh, documents when it comes to answering this question. All right. So once we have kind of figured out which ones are the most relevant questions uh, or relevant pieces of our documentation that we want to include, we need to construct a prompt that includes those. So in my case, essentially what I told ChatGPT is that, hey, you're a senior VOD expert, and you love to help developers and answer this user's question about uh, flow development. Flow here is a variable, so I can change that out for whatever framework is actually being used. And then I'm telling it to answer it with the help of the information in the documentation. Then I interpolate in the re relevant pieces of documentation, and we'll take a look at this a little bit closer later on, and then give some kind of further instructions on how I want the answer to actually uh, to actually happen. Okay, I'm getting one report that my sound is gone again. Anyone else having this problem? No? Okay. Okay, so I'm hearing only one person is saying, everyone else is saying that we're good. So um, unless I start hearing hundreds of people saying things are horribly wrong, I'm not going to get too worried. All right, thank you all. Uh, okay, so we've instructed the... Uh, the our chat GPT, who it is, what we want it to do, and then we give some instructions on how we want that answer to actually uh, be done. So we want essentially the output to be markdown, so we get nice formatting. We want code snippets as much as possible because we are doing programming, and it's super helpful if we can just copy paste uh, helpful code snippets. And instead of having just one giant paragraph of text, it would be helpful if it's just split into smaller paragraph. So once we have kind of that done, we construct this list of messages that we're going to send over to ChatGPT. Essentially, we have that prompt all the way at the top as the first message. Then we have all that documentation uh, that we fetch from our vector database. Then we send as much of the message history as we're able to fit in there. And being very mindful that we want to have enough space left in our context to actually do the actual response uh, or get the actual response to fit in there as well. So once we've constructed this list of messages, we call chat GPT. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, this is how it looks behind the scenes. It's, it's a jumping brain. And once it's done with its thinking, it gives us a answer. And in this case, we want to stream the answer. So it can take chat GPT sometimes tens of seconds to actually generate the full thing. And if we were waiting for that full thing to get uh, generated, it would not be a very great user experience. So instead, what we want to do is, as the answer is streaming in to our server, we want to show that answer all, uh, all the way to the user. All right, so if we take a closer look at how we actually go about doing this. So the first step, uh, kind of creating these vector embeddings, requires us to somehow take our documentation and process it. So it means that we want to somehow kind of split the documentation into meaningful blocks. And if you think about how the vector embeddings work, they try to capture the meaning of a piece of text. So if we have a very long document that covers 10 different topics, it would be very hard for us to say, like, what's the meaning of that versus if we split that document into kind of sections where each section 
kind of uh, talks about one specific thing. That way, it's easier for us to capture the actually most important pieces of uh, documentation as we're searching. But we want to split the documentation into meaningful sections. We then take each one of those sections, we pass it over to the uh, OpenAI Embeddings API to get a vector uh, back. And then we take those and save them into a vector database. In my case, I'm using Pinecone. There are other vector databases. I know Postgres has a plugin for vectors. Uh, there's, I think Redis has added support for vectors recently as well. So there are many options that you could use where you actually store these. And then asking the question with the context again, as we kind of already touched on a little bit, means that we start with taking the user's question, we create an embedding for that, and we then go to our vector database, Pinecone in this case, to find the 10 most relevant, most kind of closely related sections that allows us then to create the uh, prompt. And once we have the question, we have the documents that support it, and we have the chat history, we need to do a little bit of math with the tokens to figure out like, well, how much of the chat history am I able to maintain while still having enough space for the, for the answer there. And once we've done all that math, we send over the appropriate kind of content to chat GPT, the brain bounces around a little bit, and we get a result. So I'm not going to go through the whole code here, because that would probably not be the most kind of useful use of any of our time. So I have the link to the actual repo where you can dig in, but this is kind of the heart of it all. So that previous slide essentially in code form. So what you can see here, if we, uh, let's see if I have a laser pointer here. So essentially the heart of the application is this get completion stream method that returns a flux of strings because we wanna stream the response over to the browser as you saw takes in the whole message history. So that's like all the back and forth messages between the AI and the user. And then it has a string for the framework. The string for the framework is something that I'm using as a namespace in my vector database. So that way I can limit the answers to just one single namespace and only get answers for that specific framework. All right. so. What I do is I extract the question from the history. So the latest uh, uh, latest message in the history will be the question. And what I need to do then is I need to call OpenAI to first moderate the entire history. So this is according to their terms, if we have an open uh, internet facing application that allows users to type in stuff, we need to first run it through their moderation that, to ensure that we're not sending over anything that's kind of inappropriate. So I moderate it and check if there's a single kind of uh, message that's for whatever reason not appropriate. We just stop there. But in other cases, what we do is we create an embedding for that question. So we call OpenAI to get an embedding vector. And we then take that embedding vector and call Pinecone to say, hey, give us the 10 most similar documents for this embedding and limit yourself just to the namespace of the framework we're using. So in this case, the three different frameworks I have available are Flow, Hilla with Lit on the front end, and Hilla with React on the front end. Calling this will give us a list of documents. And we then pass those into another method that I call get prompt with context. So that takes in the history, the documents, and that constructs that kind of uh, final list of messages that we're going to send. So that does all the math about kind of counting the tokens and figuring out uh, essentially, do we need to kind of take off any of the older history messages in order to fit the the answer into the into the context. And once we then have a list of messages that we want to send over to ChatGPT, we finally send that over to OpenAI. And we're using the streaming API. So OpenAI has two different API variants. We could use the blocking API, which would just wait until the entire uh, entire response is generated. But like I said, that could take anywhere between like 10 to 30, 40 seconds sometimes to generate an answer. And that's not usually very acceptable. So instead, we're using 
a stream and we're just returning that. And in this case, because I'm returning a, uh, I'm returning that same flux from my endpoint in Hilla, I'm able to just append that text to the UI as it's coming in. So that makes us, or that makes it a pretty nice user experience for the end user where they're actually able to see things as, as they're happening. So why did I go this route, essentially? Why didn't I, I don't know, say, train a model of my own or fine tune an existing model with new stuff? I, I think there are a couple of reasons why you could make a pretty good case for going with this kind of vector embedding uh, approach. One is that's very kind of easy and cheap to do. In my case, uh, when I was working on this only on Hilla initially, it cost me about 10 US dollar cents to generate the embeddings for the entire documentation. Since then, they've dropped the API cost by 75%. So now it would be like considerably cheaper yet to do that. And you could essentially run this uh, vector generation API or, or kind of model locally as well if you didn't want to pay, but we're literally talking about fractions of a cent to, to do that. The other thing is it's very easy for us to update. So if we are a little bit smarter about how we do that than I did in my, in my example, what you're able to do is essentially have a hash for each document. So as your CI runs and it sees like, all right, well, only one out of these 500 documents that we have has actually changed since last time. So we don't need to like rerun vectors for everything. We can just run it for that one. And that allows us to just kind of keep keep the documents in our vector database always up to date with a very kind of minimal effort and cost. And as we saw with the use of namespaces here, that allows us to be very specific with what information specifically we want to give to the uh, to the LLM as its context. So that way we can really focus down on like I want to only use the documentation for this specific version or about this specific product as the context for answering this question. And that can kind of greatly reduce the amount of hallucination and just weird answers that you get from, from the LLM. One very kind of interesting side benefit that I hadn't really thought about when I started out building this is that it also opens up our documentation to a lot of users that might not have been able to kind of use our documentation efficiently uh, otherwise, meaning that you can ask questions and get answers in pretty much any language that ChatGPT has a firm grasp on. So that's, I think, about 100 and plus languages that it can pretty fluently answer in, which is really, really cool, I, I think, because now you can essentially make your documentation available to a much wider audience that you necessarily have kind of the budget and capacity to handle just by, by yourself within your project. All right, so uh, I want to share a couple of links here before we get to the questions and answers section here. So again, uh, you probably already had a chance to play around with the the assistant itself, but again, if you didn't, it's on bondocsassistant.fly.dev. And you can find both the front end code, which is the Hill app that's actually running uh, the whole, uh, orchestrates the whole thing on my uh, GitHub docs assistant. And if you want to look at the hairy implementation for me actually splitting our ASCII doc into uh, embeddings, you can find that on vaadin docs embeddings. So in our case, we are using ASCII doc for our embeddings, which turned out to be not as well supported by Langchain and other tools out there. So I had to do a little bit more work myself. But if you're using Markdown or something, that process would be probably a whole lot easier for you. And I assume as, as kind of tools are evolving at breakneck spades that that would probably get easier in the coming months up ahead. Perfect. All right, so let's get to some questions. I see that we've had some questions coming in here uh, over the course of the uh, presentation. And if you have more questions, keep them coming in. And I'll start from, I'll have to scroll down a little bit here to see if I can uh, find the first one, since we had a lot of questions about <laughs> bad connectivity here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Let's see. 
Yep. Okay. We hear you. All right. So first of all, Charlie, not a question, but a suggestion uh, for the first poll. I think no, but open to it might have gotten most work uh, votes. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. I didn't spend probably enough time <laughs> considering the options there. Very good. Um, all right. So then let's see here. Uh, so Patty asked, great talk. Did you also have to do open AI service, get embedding for all your documentation sections and upload them to Pinecone? Uh, no. So I did that separately. So my embedding generation is essentially a, is a node script. The reason for that is that that's something that's like right now I'm running it manually on my computer, but in reality, that should be something that's running like on a CI server or kind of automatically getting run whenever the documentation API or the documentation repo changes. So that way you don't have to manually run it. Uh, could you give some insight to how the number of words, pages, of documentation map to the number of tokens in a prompt? I think the easiest way maybe for that is to, let me see if I have, maybe I'll change my share here and I'll show some of the code here. So turn that off for a sec, then I will. Make this a little bit bigger here. So I'm definitely not going to go into the whole like <laughs> counting because that's a little bit kind of ex extracurricular for this. But essentially, I've defined constants for how much I, I'm willing to spend for different parts of this. And the actual kind of magic here is using this library uh, for uh, doing the encoding ourselves. So we're using the same base encoding as ChatGPT is doing. So we can essentially take the text, we can encode it to tokens and count how many tokens there are. So that way we get a, a sense for how many tokens we need to, to use. Uh, all right, so then, good. About pricing, does asking each question cost or is it just the time to create the embedding? So yeah, doing each question does cost money. And that costs differently depending on which model you're using. So I'm using ChatGPT or the GPT 3.5 Turbo with the 4K context window, which is a quite cheap model to run. So let's see here. Uh, so if we look at the pricing here for GPT Turbo, that's around what is that, a tenth of a cent per 1,000 tokens. So if we're using 4,000 4, tokens, we're essentially for a question with answers, that means that it'll be like half a US cent per question answered. Of course, if you use a, a better model like GPT-4, bigger context, that becomes more expensive. So you can decide kind of how much you're willing to spend depending on which model you're using. But there is a there is a cost. I found it to be quite reasonable for what I'm doing right now, at least. All right, uh, let's continue. So Chris is asking, suppose I mix the HR documents and sales documents. I only want my HR people to query the HR docs. Uh, can this be done by ChatGPT or do I need to do a program? Uh, do I need to program the filtering myself? I think what you're describing is quite similar to what I'm doing with the with the framework filtering. So if you didn't try this out, you you can probably see that there is this kind of uh, filter here where you can filter which framework you want. In your case, that would be like sales or HR. And what I'm doing here then, if we look at the Pinecone service, uh, it takes in a namespace. In our case, that namespace is the framework. In your case, that would probably be department. And as we're, we pass that as a, as a parameter to Pinecone. So essentially we've saved the documents for each framework in a separate namespace within that database. So they're not kind of all mixed up into one big 
uh, big database. Uh, all right, then we have a question about having a lot of data in say a Postgres database, how do I create embeddings for my data? Uh, I mean, the process would be the same. You would split it into reasonable size chunks and then you would take each chunk and create an embedding. Depending on how much you have and how much money you're willing to spend, you could either use the open AI embedding uh, API. You could locally create those uh, embedding vectors as well. Uh, but yeah, so there's nothing really different about having much of data. You probably want to parallelize a little bit more so it runs quicker. Uh, but yeah. Okay, so then let's see. Ben is asking, I thought Langchain didn't support Java. No, there's no official Java support for Langchain. There is a, a third-party Langchain kind of project that I found. In my case, the embedding generation is running on Node because that's something I can easily run on a, a C, uh, CI server. So in that case, I'm able to use Langchain, the JavaScript Langchain there. All right, Thomas asks, are there subscription fees to be paid for using ChatGPT commercially? Uh, there are the API fees that you need to pay, but that's that's it. there's no separate subscription as far as I know. Uh, all right, then we have a question about, can we have a look at the code? Can you show the details about connectivity to the database? Well, we're essentially, we're looking at that right now. So the database is behind the REST API in our case. Uh, Pinecone is a separate kind of service that we're calling. If we had a local database, this would obviously look different. So in, in our case, this is just a, a REST query using a Spring Web client. Thomas, thanks for a brief and straight to the point talk. Thank you very much. All right, then we have um, Chris asked about how we how I go went about splitting the documents into sections. Uh, I tried different ways of doing that, and that's actually one part where I think I could do a better job. So if we uh, if we open that, and this is a little bit hairy here, but what I ended up having to do is essentially I took the ASCII doc, I turned it into HTML, and then I'm using a splitter from Langchain. So I'm using the recursive character text splitter, which essentially just chunks it into sizes of a couple thousand characters. So this isn't by any means optimal. Uh, for Markdown especially, it's, or uh, yeah, for Markdown especially and some others, you could go about like essentially trying to split it by say headings so that you get one section of content. I tried that initially with the ASCII doc. I wasn't able to get it working as well as I wanted. So I abandoned that for now, but I think that's something that's worth revisiting. I noticed that the better I'm able to kind of do the document splitting, the mo more kind of meaningful those sections become, the better the answers were. So that's that's kind of worth keeping in mind. Mm. All right, Finn asked essentially the same. So you split the documentation by headlines and generated. Yeah, that is like on a conceptual level, I split everything by heading into smaller sections so that each section has a kind of a similar meaning and then I created embeddings. All right, how much effort would it be to switch to another similar to JetGPT LLM? It wouldn't be too hard. Uh, you could probably kind of abstract that quite easily behind like an abstract the API or just like an interface where you could swap out those. The only thing that would kind of need to be also considered is like making sure that you take care of the different kind of token limits and different token encoding so that you kind of keep to their limits. So I would say it's straightforward to do. Uh, it was kind of outside the scope of my proof of concept, but nothing that would be too too difficult to do. Uh, Fabian asks about which model I used for creating the embeddings. So for that, I was using the, uh, I'm using this model, the OpenAI 88 B2 model. 
which is very, very cost effective. Let's put it that way. All right. Uh, Herman asks, is this approach about using embeddings better than actually fine tuning the model? For example, made it uh, using made up questions about each part of the documentation or using questions and answers from Stack Overflow. I guess that depends on what you're trying to accomplish. In my case, uh, I wanted to have the flexibility of switching the context depending on what you're asking about. And somehow my Bluetooth speaker, <laughs> apparently I'm having a lot of trouble today with audio. Uh, yeah, anyway, so having this approach allows me to kind of switch the context that I want to use in any given situation, which is super helpful. Uh, the other thing is that as the documentation gets updated, there's no need to like figure out how do I tell the model to forget about that thing that was there from before, because now it's different. So this allows me to always very easily keep the most up-to-date information there. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve, but I think for this specific use case, this is a very kind of functional, easy way to go about it. Uh, all right, then there was a question about testing. So how did you test, not the technologies, rather the uh, chat GPT output itself? Uh, I didn't really test anything besides just like manually testing. It's really hard because it's not a deterministic uh, system. It doesn't give a reliably similar answer every single time that you ask it. So it's kind of hard to ask questions or test it in that sense. Uh, I do remember in the beginning when I was asking questions, I was getting some like weird answers. I'm like, that's not right. And sure enough, I went into the source documentation and we had mistakes in there. So it was actually a pretty good way of finding mistakes in our documentation. I've also noticed that anything that it's now kind of struggles with answering is likely things that we haven't covered very well in our documentation. So it turned out to be a pretty good way also of like, looking at our documentation through the eyes of a of an outsider because asking it questions and if it struggles to answer those it's a very good indication that those are things we haven't covered in enough detail in our documentation uh there's a nice question about getting view js code in the future uh, perhaps if we end up adding support for view js to hill at some point how does it find the chunk of the document to answer from? Uh, that is all pine cone. So because we have a vector embedding that corresponds to each chunk of the documentation, and what I'm saving in the vector database, is essentially that vector and as its metadata, the actual source text of it. So when I do a vector uh, database query in pine cone, I get those vectors along with their source texts and I can then use those source texts to uh, for for the context. All right, so then we have a question about sensitive internal documents. Uh, any kind of GDPR issues? I don't know. I, I mean, this would, like, basically, would you would you send these in to chat GPT in general? I don't know. It, it's hard for me to say, like, definitively. You could like limit the exposure of sensitive material by having uh, having the embeddings and the vector database internally. Uh, that's something that you could do quite easily. But I mean, as long as you're using an external LLM and sending over that stuff, that's always a, like you're always sending things to a third party and that might, might or might not be okay, depending on what you're doing. Uh, one thing that is kind of, looking good right now is that the locally runnable models are becoming a lot more capable. There are already things I can run locally on my MacBook, for instance, that are able to give me pretty good answers. So I think going forward, you might be able to also run a pretty capable models, either locally, like uh, to your company, or at least the other option would be to like use Microsoft's like paid open AI service where you, I think you can spin up your own instance that's kind of separate from others if you want to do that. Uh, all right, is it right to say that your local code already filters all the relevant documentation, ChatGPT only summarizes? Yeah, I think that's sort of 
sort of okay, yeah. So essentially we're filtering uh, the documentation through the vector search and, and chat GPT then just chooses that as, as its background. Andreas, thanks for the talk. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, then we have a question about best practice to structure this. Uh, if the data that uh, is queried changes rapidly. Mm. So what are the emails that came today regarding online purchases? Uh, I don't know, like if you're, if you want to query about something that's like a smaller data set and it's always changing, maybe you don't need to do a, maybe you don't need to do vectors for that. You could, uh, I don't have a, straight off the top of my head as on how to do that, but uh, you could still use a very similar kind of vector uh, approach to that since creating the vectors is a quite quick and easy operation. All right, uh, question about meta information. Uh, so did you get ChatGPT to give you feedback on the actual documentation, contradictions, et cetera? Uh, so no, I didn't directly get that, but I, as I was hinting earlier, like I did notice just by using it that some things aren't covered very, very well. So as we're rolling out a more official version of this, I hope that we can add a some sort of button where users of this can flag questions where they're getting uh, answers that aren't super helpful and that hopefully we can use that information to kind of pinpoint areas that aren't aren't very well covered in our Uh, another question about testing. Yeah, like I said, not, not too much testing going on here in, in this little proof of concept. Uh, how sensitive is the process to the exact construction of the prompt? So yeah, that's another good question, another area where I think I could improve this even further. So I, I spent a lot of time trying different prompts. Initially, I had a very strict prompt saying like, answer only using the material in the documentation. If it's not in there, just say, I don't know. That was really good for kind of avoiding hallucinations. The bad side of that is that when you're working with our tools, you're very often kind of, it's not, there's not like a clear distinction between like you're working with Vaughn or you're working with Spring or some like JPA stuff. And if, since we don't cover all of like these third party technologies in our documentation that limited the scope of and kind of usability of the product quite a lot. So I ended up relaxing the prompt saying like use the documentation as you're answering, but I didn't limit it to like only that. So it can answer based on what it knows about spring boot development or spring data or hibernate or whatever else. Uh, all right. Wallace asked about showing the code where we send our documents to be trained. I think that's essentially where we do the embeddings. Okay. I can, uh, show you that real quick here. So I have this open AI service here and, 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 and let's see, moderate. So here it is. Essentially, this is what it does. So it takes the text, it sends it over to the V1 embeddings API with the text uh, as a, as a content. So very straightforward. What you get back is a list of doubles, so essentially a vector. Uh, Tony asks how long it took me to learn and build all of this. The initial version I built in about a day, of like <laughs> a long, long-ish day where I was just trying to learn and do, and the code was horrendous and sort of worked, and then I. I've kind of iterated and uh, rebuilt things. So initially I built it uh, just as a node script and then I uh, redid it with Spring Boot and, and Java into a much more kind of sensible application that I might actually want to maintain for a longer period of time. Um, did you try to use the larger context 16K? Um, I haven't tried it as such, but I don't think it would be much slower, it's just that it's more costly. So in this case, I was mostly like the, 
the reason I went into this was more proving that this is a viable way of going about doing it. So we might look into doing uh, longer context. I don't know if 16 is required. That's probably a, like longer than necessary, but we might look into like 8K would already give us like a lot of information. Like that might even be like too much, uh, too big of a context for what's actually needed. Like if you start thinking about how much that would mean like sending like 10 extra full pages of of documentation for answering a simple question. Like I, I think with the 4K window, we're already able to kind of capture the most relevant stuff in there. Uh, all right, so then we have a question about the number 10. I said 10 nearest vectors are uh, considered by question. Is this a limit of max tokens? No, this was more or less a estimate on my part, and I might not end up using all of those uh, 10 documents either in my answer. So I have a limit in my code here on how much I want to use for the context at most. So when I'm constructing this, I will essentially build a string out of those uh, documents up until I hit that limit of tokens that I want and then no more. So essentially I start with the most relevant document and then I keep adding more documents until I hit the limit of how many tokens I'm willing to use for, for that. Uh, somebody asked if they can share the docs assistant URL. Yeah, go ahead. That is perfectly fine. But like I said, we'll hopefully have a more kind of official version later this year, but up until then feel free to use it. Uh, you can add issues to the GitHub repo if you find something that could be improved or <laughs> just simply wrong. So go ahead and do that. Um, all right, then I had a question about code snippets. How do I separate code snippets from normal documentation sections? Uh, I didn't really kind of separate them, so I kept them as a part of that document section. Uh, do you have any insights how ChatGPT generates the same answer based on findings in the vector database? Well, I mean, that goes into like, how do LLMs work in general? I think that's a topic that would take much longer than we have here, but essentially, I mean, it's applied statistics, I think you could call it. It's a big neural network that crunches those and generates the next probable and uh, next probable word essentially one at a time and that's how it works it's yeah that's so kind of statistics and magic mostly all right um is a github link to the beta assistant available yes um let me go back to the slides here put them up here so you can copy that while you're while we're talking here uh, when can we get a sample application using chat GPT using flow? Uh, we have a, I updated the, the demo we have at, at conferences to use chat GPT from a flow application. So uh, if I'll, if I remember, I'll try to add a link to the, to the email that goes out after this, where you could see that, but essentially the code is exactly the same. So you could look at the code in this application because it's just Spring Boot code. So instead of appending to a, uh, like sending things to the client side, you would just update the uh, UI in Java. Uh, Langchain also allows the return of the sources. Did you consider implementing that? I did, but essentially I, at that point I had already more or less gotten as much as I had hoped out of this proof of concept. So I think that's something that we'll probably take a look more as we get to implementing an actual version of this. Um, then there's a question about the actual writing of documentation. Are there styles that work better for the documentation, like repeating information and in headings and the text? Mm, I haven't gone that far that I could answer that really, but I think as long as it's kind of helpful for humans, it tends to be helpful for LLM. So I don't think that you'd have to like do anything very specific there. Uh, are there hugging face models, which works equally well, uh, which are free and can be modified to use on your own data? I haven't tried any, like I said, I haven't tried any local 
uh, models or any anything from Hugging Face for this, just because I wanted to work with an LLM that I know works well. That said, I think that like I don't see a reason why you couldn't do that. Like some of those models are starting to be pretty good, and like to the to answer the earlier question where somebody was concerned about security, running a model like that locally could allow you to not like send data outside of your organization. So that might be might be something to look into. All right. Wow, that was that was a lot of questions. Thank you everyone for for those. I think we're gonna wrap up here. And like I said, we are going to uh, send the slides and the, the recording after this. So you can take a look. Hopefully you're able to kind of copy over all of the links that you need here. And with that, I wanna thank you all for joining the summer edition of the Vaden webinar. I apologize for the little kind of audio mishap we had in the beginning. Thanks for sticking through it. It was really great seeing you here and I'll see you in the next one. So. Thank you all. Bye.